where we stopped last week. How to test the symmetry of a bit sequence. Now this is my first question to you early Monday morning. Let's remember what symmetry means. What is symmetry of a bit sequence? Okay, again the question exactly equal. No? It depends. If we talk about an infinitely long sequence, then exactly equal is correct. Because the limit of the relative portion of ones in the sequence for length towards infinity has to be 0.5, exactly 0.5. Otherwise, our sequence is biased. Otherwise, we have a shift. Okay, but for finite sequences, you're right. Huh? For finite sequences, um, the probability for a 1 should not be exactly 0.5. I mean, sometimes it's okay, but not always. So if you test your random numbers a couple of times, and you always get 0.5, as the relative number of ones, then this sequence is not random. Okay, so now what, what could we do to test the symmetry? So, shall I start with the basics and then ask you the advanced stuff, or should we do the other way around? Yeah? Maybe just count the ones and zeros. Yeah, count the ones and zeros. I think that's a good idea. Huh? Okay, and now we know the number of ones, say 212 ones. And 250 zeros. Okay. So now, is this sequence symmetric or not? So now, I mean, of course, this is a difficult question, because now, intuitively, I guess you would say, no, this is not, not symmetric. Because the difference between the number of ones and zeros is too big. The difference is 212, 250, so the difference is 38. Maybe if there is one million and thirty-eight ones and one million zeros, then you would say this is acceptable. So it obviously depends on the length of our finite prefix of the sequence. Huh? But, and now you see what we want. We want to design a statistical test. And uh, I mean the answer of the statistical test is is binary. It's yes or no. Huh? So yes means we accept this sequence of random numbers and no means we do not accept it. It does not pass the test. Huh? Okay, yeah, let's start uh, going towards uh, such a test. So
What we could do is count the number of ones and count the number of zeros. Yeah? Um, let me make a different suggestion. Let us compute, so if x, um, um, yeah, if the xi are just our random values, so x1 is the first bit, x2 is the second bit, and so on. Okay, then let us compute the mean, which is 1 over n sum i equal 1 to n xi. The mean of our bits. Now, if our sequence is perfectly random, then what would you expect as the mean? Point 0.5, yes. So you see, uh, computing the mean is a good idea in order to, to determine um, whether our sequence is random or not. Huh? Um, exactly 0.5, but only for n towards infinity. Huh? So we would expect, um, let's, let's put an index n here, the limit for n towards infinity of x bar to be 0.5. That's what we would expect. But if n is smaller, then we would have some deviation from uh, 0.5. Okay. And now the, the critical question is, how much deviation from 0.5 do we allow? And now what we will use now is the central limit theorem. Huh? I hope you all remember it. It's not too long ago, maybe two months or three, uh, in the winter semester. Who can tell me something about the central limit theorem? Can we make a second math exam now? No math exam in the first block Monday morning. Is it again very Okay, so I didn't understand everything. I, I understood that there is a curve that looks like this and something about the standard deviation. Yeah, for the standard deviation it is 99.5 and then it is 97. The, the standard deviation is 99.5? No. But, I mean, yeah, these terms are relevant. 99.5, oh no. 95. I think I talked about 95, the number 95. 95 percent. Huh? So now let's draw such a Gaussian distribution. Why not? Okay. And now, I mean, this distribution has a uh, um, an expected value, and then there is mu minus 2 sigma, and here somewhere there is mu plus 2 sigma. And now, oh. and now the integral over this normal distribution from mu minus 2 sigma up to mu plus 2 sigma, this area is 0.95. Uh, 
approximately. Huh? So that means 95% of the probability sum is in this area. Or in other words, the probability that our random variable is in this area is 95%. Huh? But excuse me, this laptop has a problem. Okay. So now, we can apply what we know here. If uh, to any um, normally distributed uh, variable. But now the question is, is our random variable normally distributed? It is Monday morning, but I mean, uh, your brain should be here. Is our random variable rand uh, randomly, <laughs> normally distributed? not. How is our random uh, numbers, uh, how are these random bits uh, distributed? Okay. Be, um, equally distributed, like, like uh, white noise. Like white noise, okay. So you would expect Something like that, or I mean, like that, yeah? I mean, this is not a nice uh, picture. Please help me. What should I draw here, and what should I draw here? We're talking about the, the probability density function of some random variable, okay? So now what should we have here? I mean, did we do some introduction to statistics or did we not? Oh, yes. X, X is other possible values of the random variable. Okay, and what's the name of our random variable? I guess X. Yeah, Xi. Yeah. Um yeah. Let's let's write for the moment probability of Xi. I mean here it depends. It depends if there if we do have a discrete variable then it actually is the probability. If we have um, a continuous variable then like it looks here we have a continuous variable uh, which has a probability which is non-zero in the interval a b. Um, but this does not mean the probability at this point has this value because the probability for observing this particular value is zero. What we have here is the probability density for continuous variables. If we, when we talk about probabilities, we always have to talk about intervals. We can now ask what is the probability for observing 
this variable in such a finite interval. And this is the integral over this area. Okay, but I, uh, so, so much about a short remem reminder on probability densities. Now let's go back to our random variable, our uh, random numbers. Okay, so we are talking about random bits. Now, can you help me what is A, what is B, does it look like that? I mean, there was the suggestion it looks like this, yeah? I mean, A could be zero and B could be one, and then the, it, it's de depending on the number uh, of, of, of bits, and then the distribution would be more stiff or not. It's depending on the number of bits. Okay, so first you say A is zero and B is one. I mean, that's a good idea. But now look, we started writing XI here. So it does not depend on the number of bits. Yeah? I just observe one bit, okay? It's only two bars now because there can't be any value between yes. zero. Have you ever seen a random bit with a value of 0.75? I didn't. Okay, so we have to modify this. We are actually not talking about a continuous random variable. We are talking about a discrete random variable. Okay, so we have just this one point here and this one point, which are one half. Probability of, of observing a zero is 0.5 and for observing a one is 0.52. Okay, so that's our distribution. Okay, and now let me ask a question. What about this guy here? It's quite a bit different. This is a continuous distribution and it does not look like this one. But that's what we have. Huh? So when the mean is calculated, this becomes a discrete distribution for the mean? Because for the mean values between 0 and 1 are possible? Okay, so again, you say when we calculate the mean, then we get a discrete distribution. Yes. Okay. And a continuous distribution. A continuous distribution. No, we get a discrete distribution. Huh? Let's start basic. We calculate the mean of two random bits, just two random bits. Okay? This is the mean and we take n equal 2. Which possible values can the mean take? The mean can be 0, if we observe two zeros, it can be one when we observe two ones, and it can be 0.5 uh, when we observe one zero and one one. Okay? And now we just have to think about the probabilities. What is the probability for observing a zero, for a one, and for 0.5? One half for um, one half and one third, uh, one fourth for zero. Yeah, one. you're right. That's what we observe if we take the mean of two bits. And you see, of course, this is a discrete distribution. Huh? And now we can continue, but I don't do this. If our n becomes larger, let's say n equals 3, 4, 5, maybe 10, then 
you get something which looks about like this. And this still is a discrete distribution, but it looks like this guy here. And for n towards infinity, this distribution converges to a normal distribution. And that's what our central limit theorem tells us. But I mean, I strongly recommend you calculate this distribution for n equal 3, 4, 5, 6. And you will get nice pictures and that's what will stay in your mind. If you just hear me talking, then what happens is what we've just seen. I mean, it, maybe it's not your fault, maybe it's my fault because I didn't give you the correct exercise. Now I give you the right exercise, okay? But, I mean, if you don't solve it, it's your fault. So please calculate the distribution for n equal 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, but still this is not what we need. Do you remember something else from this central limit theorem? So, I don't know, maybe for n equal 10, the, 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 distrib the discrete distribution looks like this. And now, for, let's say, n equal 40, It may look like this. So the more n you take, the, the more narrow our distribution becomes and, and the higher. Huh? But for n equal infinity, would it be a straight line? Yes. And why would it be a straight line? We already talked about this. Look, for n towards infinity, we get 0.5 as the mean of our bits. Oh no, that's not, um, actually that's not it. Yeah? I mean the mean uh, the mean still may be, may be 0.5. Uh? Sorry, we, d we didn't talk about this. Uh? But for n towards infinity, the distribution of our bits gets more and more narrow. Okay, and for n equal infinity, it really is a, we call this a Dirac delta function. Oh, no, sorry, no, no point here. It's infinitely high. Because the integral over this point has to be 1. And of course, because the width is 0, then the height has to be infinity. That's what we get for n towards infinity. And because the width of this distribution is 0, the standard deviation also is 0. So then we exactly get one half all the time. But as soon as the width is non-zero, then of course the empirical mean may deviate a little bit from 0.5. Okay, so now the question is, look, I mean this is a nice picture, the green uh, uh, distribution, that's what we may get 
when we empirically, not theoretically, calculate. Your exercise I gave you is to theoretically estimate this distribution. Huh? But when you empirically, you just make experiments and uh, um, and calculate them. Uh, oh, what, do, what do we do actually? Yeah, we calculate the mean. We calculate the mean for n equal 40, n equal 10, and so on. And then the mean with, yeah, sorry, this is the distribution. The distribution of the mean has to be uh, symmetric. But you see that the probability that you get 0.5 for the mean is highest. But with a lower probability, you may even get this value for the mean. Huh? You may even get such an extreme value for the mean. But the probability is very small. And now the question is about the standard deviation of the distribution of the mean value. That's the question. Huh? And uh, the central limit theorem tells us, gives us a formula how the standard deviation of the mean, um, how this standard deviation behaves depending on n. And this says sigma n is the standard deviation of the mean um, for a given n. Huh? So let's write it like sigma of x bar n. Yeah? So this sigma n is the standard deviation of this new random variable. And this is equal to um, it depends on our original sigma, the sigma of our original random variable. And how does it depend on the original sigma? I mean, this is not correct, what you see here. We have to modify this a little bit. Do you remember what does the central limit theorem tell us? The central limit theorem does not directly talk about the mean. It talks about the sum of random variables. So it talks about sum i equal 1 to n xi. Yeah? For such a sum, depending on n, we have sigma n is equal to um, square root of n times sigma. Okay, look, if I take the sum of n random variables, then of course the average grows proportional to n. So if n is equal to 10, then of course I add it 10 times and then uh, the mean is on average 10 times bigger. But, and that's the interesting result, the standard deviation does not grow linearly with n, it grows only with the square root of n. Okay? So this is for the sum of n. And what's very important, um, these xi 
have to be I I D independently identically distributed so they all have to come from the same distribution first um, and the experiments have to be done independently they have to be statistically independent and this is the the really ingenious result it does not depend on the original distribution no matter how our distribution looks like it may be like this, a discrete distribution. Okay, and, but now here we are talking about the mean. The mean is, of course, closely related to this. The difference is just you divide this by n. Okay, so what we get here is exactly this. Square root of n times sigma but we divide the whole thing by n, which is sigma divided by square root of n. I hope your memory now comes back from what we did uh, before Christmas. I mean, this is really, really basic and important. Okay, so now we apply this formula. We apply this formula to our random bits. Um, yeah. In order to apply it, we have to know that mu, the mean of our random bits, um, no, um, we don't know what mu is, but we know, of course, the expected value. The expected value of our random bits xi is equal to one half. We also know that sigma, the standard deviation of our random bits, is one half. And um, I'm quite sure this is one of the first exercises. Oh, did I forget? Uh, no, I didn't. Let me see. Did I print all exercises? Yes. Ah, yeah, it's exercise 1.4. Calculate the expected value and the standard deviation of a true binary random, uh, random variable. Okay? So you will calculate these two things, which is really simple. And now from this, we can derive what we have here. We can say sigma n is equal to sigma divided by square root of n, which is 1 over 2 square root of n. Okay? And thus, 2 sigma n is equal to 1 over square root of n. And now we can, we can apply this because look at this picture. We know that our distribu the distribution of the mean converges to a, a Gaussian distribution for n towards infinity. So if the number of measurements is large like one million, then it really looks like uh, such a normal distribution. And then we know the, mu the, the, the mean should be around one half. 
and we know what two sigma is and now we know that in 95 percent of our experiments the mean has to be in this interval because of this integ integral property of the normal distribution. And that's what we do in statistics. I mean we can never guarantee that the mean is in the interval mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma. But we know that in 95 percent of all our measurements it has to be in this interval. And that's why we define the test to be passed if our empirical mean is in this interval. Okay, let's continue with our uh, experiment. So let's take n equal 1 million. 10 uh, power 6 and then our 2 sigma 2 sigma 6 is equal to 1 over the square root of 10 power 6 which is 1 over 1000. Okay, so then we um, we say test uh, passed if mu is in the interval one half minus one over, oh, I mean we could exactly write it the decimal number so it, which is 0 0.499 and 0 0.50 one, yeah. Okay, that's a symmetry test. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Um, we have been talking about pseudo random number generators um, and you maybe you have already seen or you will see that this um, where do we have it here this linear congruence generator with these recommended parameters is far from being random it's actually I would say it's extremely non-random <coughs> or maybe very non-random um, and now I give you the formulas of one particular pseudo-random number generator which produces much better random numbers. Um, we, of course, we don't go into the detail. I just give you the formula without, without any understanding. Because in order to understand what's going on here, we would really have to dive into, uh, um, into the, uh, the theory of, uh, into number theory, yeah? Um, but let's, let's just look at it. Okay, yeah, and before we go into this, let me tell you that if we make our formula more difficult, what we had was a linear congruence generator, so the formula in these parentheses here was just a times xn minus 1 plus b. So just a linear function. Now we can add a quadratic term, a cubic term and so on. And then we get a polynomial. 
That's what we have here. Huh? Polynomial congruential generators of this form, they are a little bit more secure, but they can also easily be cracked. And now what uh, Blum, Blum and Chubb uh, proposed in 1986 is a pseudo-random number generator with very high quality, very long period, and uh, very good statistical properties. Yeah, and so how does it how does it go? I mean, the algorithm is quite simple. First, we have to choose two <coughs> primes p and q. Um, and these two primes, they both have to be uh, congruent to three modulo four. What does that mean? That means if you divide uh, these primes p and q by 4, then you need to get a remainder of 3. Now which numbers are of this type? Of course, 3 is such a number, then 7, 11, uh, 15, 19, 23, and so on. Let me see. Yeah. Look. 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19, um, 21, 23, This is a list of all odd numbers. And what we take here is every second odd number. Huh? But only these um, congruent to three. Huh? The, yeah. So every second odd number is allowed as such a factor P and Q. And now what we do is we calculate n as the product p times q. What does this remind you of? Have you ever seen such a formula? Choose two primes, take the product. Binomial distribution. Huh? Binomial distribution. Uh, in the binomial distribution, I, I guess we have something like n times p or something like that. The norm, I don't know, but I mean this question of course goes to the computer science students. Where have you seen this? You, I mean you really have to know. Yes. In, in cryptography, the, uh, I mean, almost all these modern uh, public key uh, algorithms like the RSA algorithm, um, you have to choose two primes, P and Q, uh, and multiply them, and then you get um, the module N for your uh, encryption formula. And look, this n is now being used as the module. Huh? So the, the, ma the mathematics behind this is, it comes from this modular uh, number theory, the same as in cryptography. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, now, the next step is we have to choose a random number S which is relative prime to N. What does relative prime mean? Um, oh, uh, I, I mean, sorry, this was a, a translation. Uh, we missed it in the translation. So in English, this should be GCD. 
greatest common divisor. Uh, so the greatest common divisor of S and N has to be 1. Uh, and if the greatest common divisor of two numbers is 1, then we call these numbers relative prime. Because they don't have a common factor. Okay, and if this holds, then we calculate the seed for our random number generator from this S. So x0, which is the seed, is S squared modulo n. Am I right that we need a random number to calculate random numbers? Yes, then you're right. And where do we get this random number? Uh, that's a good question, I don't know. I don't know. Um, look, you need such a random number all the time. Let's go back to our uh, congruence generator. This is the recursive formula, but you don't see how you get x0. I didn't tell you because I don't know. So that's, that's up to you. I mean, that's, as it is always in mathematics, the really difficult part um, is up to the user. Huh? You can take, as x0, you can take 0 or whatever. You can take 0 all the time. If you do this, if you take 0 all the time, um, what's the problem then? The problem is when you start your computer simulation for the second time, you will get exactly the same, shall I say, non-random or random numbers. I mean, if they are the same, then you couldn't call them random. And that's why whenever you restart your random number generator, you would actually like to have a different seed. But of course this seed cannot come out of your random number generator because, I mean, we need it before, before it wakes up, this random number generator. So you need a different source. You need a different source for this random seed. And I can tell you how computers do this. I mean, every, every computer has a built-in pseudo-random number generator for various purposes. Maybe a computer game needs some randomness or other algorithms need a little bit randomness. And, and then these computers, they take some numbers which are kind of random, like the, the time. I mean, we could, uh, we, uh, the computer could uh, from the internal clock take some part of the time. Of course, not, not the year. It would be better to take the, the, the millisecond, the current millisecond, which is just the last digit maybe of the time. And this, of course, uh, varies quite fast. And um, so the probability that the millisecond when you uh, start your simulation or whatever is the same as last time, it's not very high and it's kind of random. But be careful, be careful. There are correlations in any numbers you, uh, you use if they are not really random. Or, uh, I mean, for example, these crypt uh, cryptographic algorithms, they need random numbers when you uh, generate an, an encryption key. Huh? And for generation of such keys, the computer uh, would ask you to type on your keyboard randomly around. Huh? 
And then if you try to, to hit some random keys, then it would exploit the sequence of the keys you hit and in particular the time, the length of the time intervals be between your keystrokes and so on and, and then would apply some mathematical formula and hopefully this random seed would be quite good. Huh? But that's a problem. Uh, it, it really is, it's, it may be a serious problem depending on the quality of your random numbers, the random numbers you need. But, I mean, here we are talking about the seed of a pseudo-random number generator. And here the problem is not so serious because in the first place you use a pseudo-random number generator. And uh, this already tells you that you are not getting perfect random numbers. So then most of the time such a seed would be okay. But I mean that's, that's very important and thank you for the question. Uh, this has to be clarified. Okay, so now we take this initial random number and I mean the good news is you only need one such random number. Or let's say, what is a, what is a, a pseudo-random number generator? You can see it as a method wh which gets as an input one random number and outputs many random numbers. Okay, now here we have the recursive formula of our algorithm. Xi is equal to Xi minus 1 squared modulo n. And so you get your sequence of the Xi, but now, now comes the crucial point. The crucial point is you do not output to the user this number Xi. What you output is bi equal xi modulo 2. Now in, in terms of the bits of our um, numbers xi, what is bi? Suppose x27 is equal to 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, something, 0, 1. Now what is B27? It can be 0 or 1, because modulo 2 you only can get zeros or 1's. It is 1, because this is the last bit is 1. So you just get the last bit of your number. That's it. So you see it's quite a simple formula. So this is the whole uh, random pseudo random number generator, these two formulas. And what we've seen here, this is just the initialization. Calculating this modulus n and uh, getting an, uh, a random seed. Yeah. BBS is considered very good. I mean the authors, they tested it and they proved that you get very high quality pseudo-random numbers with a very long period. And now what's important is in their paper, and I'm sorry this is missing uh, on the, at least on the slides, I don't know whether it's on this, in the script. Um, 
this n has to be at least uh, at least about 1,000, um, no, 2 to the power 1,000. So that means a 1,000 bit number. Yeah. And so you see, if we compute modulo such a large number, which has uh, at least uh, 300 decimal digits, it's a really large number, then our xi are between 0 and this large number. <coughs> so they, they are very large numbers. And now at every step from our 1,000 bits we get for any new random number, we just output the last bit. So we throw away 999 bits, we just uh, throw them in the trash can. And we use just one bit. Huh? But, I mean, that's the trick how to get good uh, pseudo-random numbers. If we would use all bits, then the quality wouldn't be good. Why wouldn't the quality be good? Look, that's why I showed you this here. If you use such a polynomial congruential generator, you, you don't get very good quality. <coughs> but look what we have here. We have a quadratic function, even without the constant term, which is quite important. So this wouldn't get good random numbers. But the trick is, from these 1,000 or more bits, you, just, you always take the least significant bit and throw away all the rest. And of course it has to be proven, and this is not easy, it has to be proven that these least significant bits, that they are uh, highly symmetric and highly independent. That's what has to be proven. You know the definition of a, a random bit generator is symmetric and independent. And that's what they prove in this paper. I mean this is not the only uh, pseudo-random number generator with very high quality. Um, there are others uh, also. I mean what you see here is you get high quality, but it costs you. It costs you a lot because you have to produce 1,000 bit in order to get one. No? And I mean, this calculation, calculating the square of xi minus 1, is quite expensive. How does the the, com the computing time for computing the square of a binary number, how does it scale with n? Is it linear? Is it n log n, is it squared, is it exponential? It's linear because you can do it with a shift operation. You can do it with a shift operation, really? Square. 
the square? I don't think so. I mean, multiplying by two, this is just a shift. Yeah. It's a shift left. Yeah? It's one shift left. Multiplication by two. I mean, if it would be exponential, then this, you couldn't apply this guy. Then there would be no, no chance to realistically apply this random. No, it's not so bad. It's quadratic. Of course it's quadratic. You remember this from school when you had it in, in the second grade. I mean, if you multiply such a number times Another number with the same size, so the number of digits is the same here. And then what do you do? I mean, you, you, you put a line here, and then you take um, the, the, what do you take? The first digit of this number and multiply it with this. Um, and then you get um, something like that. Then you take the second digit, multiply it uh, with the whole number, and then, no, you take this first digit with this, the second with the whole number, and so on. And finally, you get these intermediate results, and then you sum them up, and at the end, the result you get has twice the length, okay? And why do we have quadratic complexity? Because if you take this first digit times this guy, this is linear in the length of your number. You have to do n multiplications just to get this. Again, n multiplications, so you get n, 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 n. How often? n times. Now n times n is n squared. Okay, I mean now the computer scientists, uh, at least the, at least you should uh, should object and say, oh no, I mean our microprocessors, they do have a hardware implementation for multiplication, and so this can actually be done in, I don't know, maybe one or two or three machine cycles. Huh? But not the one on the but not with 1,000 bits, yeah? I mean, if somebody would construct really a chip for a hardware for multiplying two 1,000 bit numbers, then this would be maybe possible in a number of machine cycles. Yeah? But uh, if you do it with a 32 or 64 bit processor, you only, I mean, then here you would have your 64 bits times 64 bits, but it would be quadratic anyway. Okay. So you see, this costs you quite a bit of time because the length of these xi is 1000 bit. So you do, you have, if you do it on bit level, you would have to do um, about one million bit multiplications. I mean, this is not a matter of hours, but it's a matter of milliseconds up to seconds, huh? depending on your uh, computer. Okay, yeah. Now, yeah, let, shall we continue with the linear feedback shift registers? Um, no, I, I mean, now I continue with, we have now been talking about um, random bit generators. No, sorry, pseudo-random bit generators. And at the beginning of this chapter, um, I mentioned that 
in order to get real random numbers. Real random numbers are such numbers which fulfill our definition, symmetry and independence. And this is not fulfilled for any pseudo-random number generator. Is this clear for you? Why can no pseudo-random number generator uh, deliver you um, random bits? Why is this impossible? That's very important. Can you give me an, I mean there are a couple of arguments. Can you give me one argument? Yes, yes. We have proven, we have actually proven this already. Huh? Um, and I mean the period, so any random bit se pseudo random bit sequence is periodic. Yeah? Um, and the, the period depends on what? Excuse me? Oh, the value of the module, yes. It depends on the module. Um, and what can you say? So what is an upper bound for the, the period of your sequence? The number of modules. Yes, the number of the module. If the function you use only depends on one predecessor. If the function depends on two predecessors, then you get an upper bound of m square and so on. Huh? But no matter how you calculate the next number, um, it's always periodic. And I mean, the underlying reason is that we use deterministic computers. Huh? Okay, so on such a digital computer, With a program, we cannot generate random bits. The only thing we get is periodic sequences. Huh? Now the question is, and we should talk a little bit about this, how can we get real random numbers? Obviously not with a computer. We have to define a, a, a random seed. We have to define a random seed. Okay. So suppose you have your random seed and then? You can get to a real random number. With, with a, a linear congruential generator. Or with a BBS generator. Oh no! Why can the BBS generator uh, not deliver us random numbers? No matter how perfect the seed is. I mean, you just told me. Huh? There is the period which is repeated. Yes, it's periodic. The BBS generator is periodic also. Look, we have a module. This module N. Now, I mean, what's, ver what's ver uh, important here is I wrote n has to be at least a thousand bit number. And this means the period of the BBS generator can be, I don't know how large it is, you would have to read the paper. It can be up to 2 to the power 1000. And this would be extremely long. Huh? This would be a period of 10 power 300 approximately. So the period, and this is true, the period of the BBS generator is really, really long. Huh? But it is finite. And thus, I mean, it's not random. First. Second, if you start the BBS generator with the same seed, you get the same sequence. No, no, it's not so easy. I mean, we, we cannot just use a really random seed and that's it. 
But anyway, tell me how you get your, your uh, 1,000 random seed bits. <coughs> Maybe with the PBS generator, we change, we change the, the I, the BI with the I. Uh, like take the last bit, uh, the number of the last bit, change, change the last number of the last bit. And then Oh, I see. So you don't just take the the one last bit, but maybe the two last bits or three last bits, and 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 then you would actually even randomly uh, select maybe one last bit, and next time two, and then five, or so on. I have no idea whether your bits will be better than or worse. Be careful. Be careful. I mean, this is uh, what students in cryptography learn. Be careful when you, I mean, there is an idea in order to get a better encryption when you encrypt files, then you take one algorithm and then you take a second algorithm on top of it and encrypt your files twice. Be extremely careful. It may even be the case that encrypting twice is worse than encrypting once. Yeah? And the same thing uh, applies here. It might, it might be the case that if, you, if the number of bits you output is, uh, is even if it's random. Uh, look, if you output all bits, the quality is bad. Yeah? And that's why they output only one bit. So maybe if you output two bit, you already have uh, a worse quality. And so. I don't know, I, I can't give you the answer. But it will be, it will be periodic and so on. Yeah? Okay, how can we get real random numbers? Yeah? And you need some kind of analog sensor and use the noise of it. Yeah, yeah that's an idea. So the first thing is we have to go out of the digital computer. Yeah? So we need to use some physical source of randomness. Yeah? And uh, the most popular physical source of randomness is to use random noise coming from uh, an analog resistor. Yeah? So now let me sketch uh, um, the the typical architecture of such a random bit generator. And of course we typically want to have these random numbers on a computer. Huh? So there is some um, electronic circuit where we have a resistor. A resistor R. Huh? And now from, um, we could measure or take um, the voltage at this resistor. Yeah? And now look, such a resistor is a physical object. And um, what happens inside this resistor I mean, it's a physical body with many molecules. And now the electric current, these electrons, they just move around here in a kind of random manner. They will, be, they will hit molecules and move around here. Huh? And now this movement in this uh, solid state body, this movement depends on the temperature. If, I mean, if we are at, at the uh, temperature absolutely zero, which is minus 273 point something uh, degrees Celsius, then there is no, no lattice movements of the molecules. They are sitting there extremely quiet, maybe in a perfect crystal, and under some conditions 
then even the resistance goes to zero if you have a superconductor. Huh? But if, if you don't have a superconductor, then at least everything is quiet and the, the, the movement of this electron is kind of deterministic. Yeah? But as soon as the temperature is higher, what we have all the time, then there is random movement, Brownian movement of these, oh no, sorry, Brownian movement is in gases. So this is just uh, uh, lattice oscillations in such a solid body. And then the movement of the electron is kind of random. Uh, and it depends on some randomness um, how easy it is for this electron to move through the resistor. Uh, and uh, so in order to make it short, the resistance uh, is time dependent. So some electrons get through easier than others. Uh, and now if you would plot this uh, voltage at the resistor over time, even though everything is constant. So you 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 uh, you put a, a a constant voltage here, let's say plus 10 volt here. Um, then of course, then we have 10 volt at the resistor, and this is what you would see over time. But now, if you amplify this uh, region, then you would see some random, random noise on top of the, these 10 volt. Okay, so now what you have to do is, yeah, sorry. <coughs> you have to take this voltage and input it into an amplifier. Amplifier. And then what the output is the amplified noise. Huh? Um, the next device is an AD converter. And now what you get here is bits or bytes, whatever. Huh? I mean, that's how um, simple um, random number generators work. Of course, the question is how good are these bits? This is a non-trivial question. I mean, to these bits, we now have to apply um, a test. For example, a symmetry test. Of course, you want to be sure that these bits are symmetric. But that's not sufficient. You, uh, you also have to make sure that they are statistically independent. So you have to apply as many statistical tests as you can find. And finally, maybe you can prove that this uh, device outputs really good random bits. And if you, I mean, if you look in the internet for uh, random number generators, real random number generators or hardware random number generators, you will find a lot of devices. And uh, in the internet you also can find um, recipes how to construct it by yourself with simple off-the-shelf electronic devices and then you would get quite good random bits. But if you want to have perfect random bits then you can buy devices of a size like that, electronic devices, which cost you 5,000 euros uh, and they output uh, very high quality random bits with very high frequency, maybe one million or even more random bits per second. Uh, and that's what, what um, people um, use for example, when they uh, 
test uh, electronic devices where they need uh, really high quality random bits or researchers and so on. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, actually time is over. So I will, I will continue next time. I will show you, I, I actually brought it today here. Um, here, you all know what this is. This is a, a hard disk of a computer and it's open. Um, and we will look inside a hard disk. I will tell you a little bit what we did, um, what I did in 2001 when I was in my sabbatical at the Maxdoor company in San Jose. And there we used an ordinary hard disk to produce real random numbers. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.